Chapter four, polynomial equations and inequalities. This is a practice test that I've posted on my PB Wiki site. So if you go there and download it, um, probably a good idea for you to practice it first. I have in front of me the solutions from a student of mine who did the test and um, I'll run over them with you and show you where she made her little mistakes. Hopefully you won't as well on your own. And um, yeah, so let's get going and, and get this cleared up for you. Okay, so it says solve the following inequalities, give your answer in interval notation. So remember if you have a double inequality like this, or an absolute value inequality, you want to separate them into two parts. It's the easiest way to do it, and you're sure not to make a mistake if you do. So you break it into two pieces so that this is the first piece here, and then the second piece would be um, using this with the other inequality. So that's what this student of mine did. She divided into two parts and solved for x. So this is pretty basic. You just have to make sure that if you're dividing by a negative, which she didn't do here anywhere, she had a negative but was not dividing by one, right? She's dividing by positive two here. And then so she has x is greater than negative one and x is less than a half. So there you go, interval notation, square brackets, because it's including these two numbers. Okay, the second one, she made a little mistake here. So the absolute value means you can have the positive of this or the negative of this. So she's divided this up nicely into two equations, um, the positive and negative, because remember that absolute value means the distance from the origin. So if I had in here, for instance, negative 52, the answer would be 52, right? So Again, the absolute value just means the positive what you get in here. So she's done it into two parts, one with just removing the absolute value sign and solving for x, so that's pretty basic. And the second one where she had the negative of this, negative of the entire bracket. So she divided by negative one and changed the sign. Note that she did the right work here, Let greater than or equal to negative 10 added the 7. It doesn't matter if you add a positive or negative to each side. It's only the dividing. Okay, remember that. So she says 5x is greater than or equal to negative 3 divided by 5x is greater than negative 3 fifths. So she said x is greater than negative 3 fifths, so she wrote this, and x is less than 17 over 5, and she wrote this. Can you see what's wrong with this answer? Because it's pretty common for people to make that kind of an error. So what we're looking at here is that if, if it's greater than this one, she should have written it this way. So minus 3 fifths. So x is going to be greater than or equal. Oh, sorry, wrong way. x is in here in the middle, right? So it's going to be less than 17 over 5. So if you were to write it in, this is not interval notation, I know. This is just showing you where the x is. It's between these two. So if she had checked a number here and said, okay, if x is between negative infinity and 17 over 5, that means when x is 4, right, because this is 3 and a little bit. So if she had said, um, say, negative 4. So if she put in negative 4 back here, she would have had negative 27 and the absolute value of that would have been positive 27, which isn't true, right? So what she should have written then is x is an element of square bracket minus 3 fifths comma 17 over 5. So it had to be between these two. That's why I wrote it out this way for you first. You could see it's between these two numbers. So if you check something in here, so let's say um, this is 3 and a bit. So let's try 3. So 15 minus 7 is 8. That is less than or equal to 10. And so, you know, you're right. Okay, so it doesn't, doesn't take much time for you to do a double check on a couple of values. Uh, and then you wouldn't lose mark. Okay, so the following inequality again. Um, I've given the graphs here so that you can fill the graph in and see by just inspection where it is greater than or equal to zero. So we have um, 
the zeros, 3, minus 1, and minus 2, which is a double. So minus 2 is a double, 1 and 3. Then you have to check to make sure you know the direction of the leading coefficient. And in this case, it's a quartic function. That's 2, 3, 4. So x to the fourth. And there is a negative. So it starts in this quadrant, ends in this quadrant, which she's done correctly. A double root means you just come up and touch that axis. Then it's going to go back through here. If you find the x-intercept, you find that it's, um, it's pretty high. But it doesn't matter because we're only trying to find out where is it above the x-axis. So obviously the only place it's above the x-axis would be here, like that, right? So she said um, x is an element between minus 1 and 3. Where is it greater than or equal to 0? Between minus 1 and 3. Why did I give her a mark for that one? That's not, oh, it's greater than or equal to. She was right. So it's equal to zero at two. So she's got between minus one and three and minus two. So that had to include this dot. Okay, the last one here. Oh, she lost a mark. What did she do wrong? Let's see. So we had zeros at zero, two, and three. Zero. Two, I think I corrected it on here so you can see what was wrong. So when you do the expansion for your leading coefficient, you have to be aware of the signs. So this is x, x squared, x cubed, but it is negative. So negative means like the slope of a negative line. So you have to start in this quadrant and end in this quadrant. Um, these are all single roots. So you go up through here, through here, and through here. Oops, what am I saying? That's when she drew. I traced her, her bad one. So it's a negative leading coefficient, like I said, has to go from here to here. So it was going this way, this way, and this way. And where is this greater than zero? So it's going to be greater than zero for x less than zero. So it should have been negative infinity and it's not equal to this time so you have to use round brackets and then it's less than uh, sorry what are we doing greater than zero okay so between two and three union two comma three x is an element okay so she had it absolutely backwards here so she only lost one mark because this would have been a proper description and just that she had it going the wrong way Okay, so I think that's all her mistakes in this section. The rest will be straightforward and easy to follow. So here she had to sketch and find where is it greater than or equal to zero. So we have zeros at minus two, minus three, minus two. Minus three is a double root and one is a single root. And check again. So we have x, an x squared, so that's x cubed now, and a negative x to the fourth. So negative x to the fourth means starting in this quadrant, ending in this quadrant. Oh, she did lose a mark for this one too. So it comes up, it just touches here. That's a double root. See, double, because there's a two. I come back down, I go through the two. Um, the y-intercept, if you check it, it's like 18 or something. It's way up here. Doesn't matter because all we're concerned about is where is this greater than or equal to zero? So greater than or equal to zero is going to be between, is this the same graph as this one? No, but it works out the same. So we have between minus two and one. So she had this all wrong, right? So we have x is an element of, so we're going to be um, three, sorry, minus three. It's greater than or equal to. So we have minus 3, it includes it, and between minus 2 and 1, greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so here and here. So this dot and this one. Okay, and the last one, the absolute value of this is greater than 10. 
Okay, so again, this is a, a huge inequality. You want to do it in two parts, again. So you want the positive of it and the negative of this. So get rid of these absolute value signs. Make yourself two equations to solve. One where you're just removing them and leaving it positive, and the other one where you're taking the negative of it. So she's got the negative sign out here perfectly. Divide it and change the sign. Divide by negative one. And then you just go through the process of the basic algebra. Now watch this one. She had negative x greater than negative 8. Change the sign when you divide by a negative. So x is less than 8. And x is greater than 28. So x isn't between these two, right? So here she's got it. If I put it on a number line, you'd say 8. x is less than 8 is going that way and greater than positive 28 so it's going this way okay so that's why you needed the two as opposed to this one again I, I know I keep coming back to this but it's important that you understand so she had if she had done this on a number line it would have made more sense right if she had put oh minus three fifths it's greater than or equal to that so I'm going this way but it's less than or equal to 17 over 5 so she would have seen it was um, in between these two. Another, another way of expressing it. Okay, so that was the first page. Um, page number, question number two. Find the equation of a polynomial with zeros of minus four, single root, three double root, and a y-intercept of minus two. So what you're being given here now, you've got the two roots, or three is single and a double, and you have the y-intercept. Remember, a y-intercept gives you a point on the graph. So y-intercept of minus 2 means x is 0, y is minus 2. Right? So that is something you should write down right away so you know you have an x and a y-coordinate. Because remember, you're trying to find a here. Okay, so very nicely, she says f at x equals a times x plus 4, that's your single root, x minus 3, that's your double root, and she plugged in x is 0 and y is minus 2, or f at x. And then solved, 4 times 9 is 36. And a is, be careful, make sure you don't divide these the wrong way. It says a is negative 18. No, it's negative 1 18th. And then you give your statement for the equation. Okay, number 3, solve by the inequality by finding the roots and graphing. Show all your work. State the solution using interval notation. Okay, so I have a cubic function, and I have to find the zeros. So this is going back to the previous chapter where you were factoring a cubic function. So the first thing you want to do is bring everything to one side of the equation. So I just move the 12 over, and then you have to factor. So you'd have to find, you know, like you go through your little, what factors of minus 12, so you do plus and minus 1, plus and minus 2, and obviously when she did the negative 2, she got 0. She should have made a statement, um, oh, she did down here, f at minus 2 is a 0. So she, she checked f at minus 2 equals 0, therefore x plus 2 is a factor. That's very important to make that statement once you found one of the zeros. So this is factor theorem, right, from the last chapter. So she did a quick synthetic division here, put in minus 2, and the coefficients of the cubic function, 6, 7, negative 16, minus 12. Remember, bring it down, multiply by this, add them up, multiply by minus 2, add them up, multiply by minus 2, add them up, and she even used my little happy face here. That probably made me smile. Okay, so that gives you a quadratic now of 6x squared, and she's got that back over here. So you see what it's like to be a teacher. You have to chase the work around the page. Make your work nice and clear for your teacher. It will make him or her very happy. Okay, so I have 6x squared minus 5x minus 6 is less than 0, and I need to factor this. So you're looking for a product of minus 36 and a sum of minus 5. She did it the old-fashioned way. I don't like that. I would have just said minus 9, um, minus 9 and 4. 
minus 9 times 4 is minus 36 minus 9 plus 4 is minus 5. Put them over the coefficient of the um, leading term here of the quadratic. So I would have put them over 6 and reduce. So that gives me 2 over 3 minus 3 over 2. And so this is 3x plus 2, which he has here, and 2x minus 3, which is here, less than 0. So then she used those zeros to make a sketch of the function. And again, it is a cubic function. Positive leading coefficient goes in the same direction as a positive sloped line. Put in your zeros. So you have minus 2. Um, this is minus two thirds here and that's her three halves and put the line through nice curve probably could have found the y-intercept here but I bet it's right off the graph right uh, well we won't bother okay so I want to know where is this less than zero so we had here right so where is it less than zero so it's between negative infinity and minus two Notice the less than, so round brackets, it's positive here, that doesn't count, and between minus 1 and, or sorry, that was minus 2 thirds and positive 3 halves. So she's got that all very nicely done. Good work, full marks. Okay, number 4. The passenger section of a train has a width, a length, and a height, all dimensions in meters. Solve a polynomial equation to determine dimensions of the section of the train if the volume is 117 cubic meters. This is very similar to what you would have done with a quadratic. You know, you'd have, um, what is the height? If, if the height is x, solve for, for um, if the height was 30 meters, Find the time when it's at 30 meters. Same thing here. Don't panic. Make up your equation. So the volume of the train is length times width times height. So she's made an equation for volume and set it equal to 117. Did the expansion. Now when you have three things to expand like this, note how nicely she does this. She does these two first and then multiplies by this second binomial. Um, brought her minus 117 to this side and simplified. Then she went through the process of finding one of the zeros, which she did right here. So she said f at 5 was 0, so x minus 5 is a factor. She did synthetic division. Very easy. Bring down the 4 times 5, add them up times 5, add them up times 5, add them up. Maybe you'll hear me saying that when you're doing your test. So she's got another quadratic here. So this is 4x squared plus 4x plus 15, which goes back here. And so one of the zeros is 5, but she has to determine whether or not there's another zero with the quadratic. Don't stop because, you know, 5 is a great answer. It's one, one possible solution. There could be others. But what she did was um, she figured out the quadratic formula which is, she should have said x equals here. You don't need to do all that. You could have just checked the discriminant. Remember the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac. So b squared would have been 16 minus 4 times 4 times 15, which you know right away is going to be less than 0. So if it's less than 0, there are no other roots, no real roots for this part. So the only solution is 5. Okay, number 5. A cyclist is competing in a tournament. He's currently in a very hilly part of the tournament's course. For his current hill, his height in meters over time is modeled by this function. Estimate the instantaneous rate of change. Okay, so we're doing rate of change here. Instantaneous rate of change. And give his direction at x equals 100. Round your final answer to two decimal places. Okay, so... She, she did it very nicely. She set up one full, um, like this is f at 100.01, and here's f at 100. So this is really like this, right? Minus f at 100 divided by, and this would be 100.01 minus 100. Right? That's how she got that number. 
So you evaluate the function at this, the function at this, divide by that, and you end up with this negative 0.73 minutes, or meters per minute. Don't forget your units. Okay, units are important. So the instantaneous rate of change is minus 0 0.073 meters per minute, and he is going down the hill. That's why negative. If it was positive, the direction is given by the sign of your rate of change. Okay, number six. The relationship between the amount of money X that Canon spends on advertising and the company's total sale is given by this function. X is measured in thousands of dollars. Are Canon's total sales increasing at a faster rate when the money, when the when the amount of money spent on advertising is a hundred thousand or one hundred and fifty thousand? So you're trying to find the um, the rate of change at these different points. I'm not a Canon shooter. I shoot Sony. It's better. Okay, so she did f at 100 and f at 100.01. So this is the same thing. She's finding the um, rate of change by doing the two separate values. And again, this one... Um, here she did the rate at 150 and the uh, the function at 150 and the function at 150.01 so she's got all her numbers set up here so the instantaneous rate of change is this is f at 100.01 minus f at 100 your teacher might want an extra decimal um, you should ask what they prefer if they're asking for instantaneous rate of change. It's an equation. You have a calculator, so you can you can figure these things out. Okay, so she's got 60.946 sales per dollar. Okay, so it was the total sales per dollar spent. Sales per dollar. And this one was 45 uh, 45.997 sales per dollar spent. So um, this is in thousands of dollars spent. So they give you give you all the amounts properly here. So they're increasing faster when the amount invested is a hundred thousand. And this number is bigger than this one. That's all you're saying. Okay, the last one. I'm going to switch to another solution because hers was a little messy. Find my solution here. Okay, the formula for finding the volume of a square pyramid is V equals one third S squared H. S is um, remember is slant height. Uh, the length of the side of the model is x plus two, or that side. Sorry, not slant height. The side. The height of the pyramid is x minus one. The volume is thirty six centimeters cubed. Uh, is that the same as you had in your question? Yeah. Okay. Determine the length of the side and the height of the pyramid if the volume is 36 centimeters cubed. Okay, so volume, we've got the side length here, x plus 2. I'm squaring it. The height, x minus 1. So now you need to expand and simplify. You want to get rid of this fraction first. So multiply both sides by 3. Expand your binomial. Multiply your binomial by your... Uh, sorry, your cube, your quadratic by the binomial to get this cubic function. Bring the 108 to the other side, and then we do some uh, factoring. So you've got to find. I said when x is four, this is equal to zero. So x minus four is a factor. Then you use your division here, synthetic division. I ended up with a quadratic that had no real roots again. So check the discriminant. Often um, there's only one solution and that's the one that was the factor. So if you know x is four, so the side length is going to be four plus two is six and the height's going to be four minus one, which is three. And I should have said centimeters for full marks. Okay, so that's, um, that's test number chapter four. I hope that helps you out and um, your teacher gives you similar kind of questions. Bye for now. Don't forget to subscribe. I need a hundred, I need a hundred thousand subscribers. <laughs>
a thousand would be good. Bye for now.